The content of this podcast has not been evaluated by Health Canada or the FDA. It is educational in nature and should not be taken as medical advice. Always consult a qualified medical professional to see if a diet, lifestyle change, or supplement is right for you. Any supplements mentioned are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Please note that the opinions of the guest or host are their own and may not reflect those of Advanced Orthomolecular Research Incorporated. Hello and welcome to Supplementing Health, a podcast presented by Advanced Orthomolecular Research. I'm your host, Dr. Paul Herkel. This show is all about applying evidence-based and effective dietary, lifestyle, and natural health product strategies for your optimal health. We are going to feature some very engaging clinicians and experts from the world of functional and naturopathic medicine to help achieve our mission to empower people to lead their best lives naturally. This episode of Supplementing Health is brought to you by AOR's Curcumin Ultra. This premium formula combines free-form curcumin in the form of curcufen plus the water-soluble parts of turmeric in the form of termosin for unparalleled effectiveness and bioavailability. This combo of well-researched extracts provides fast-acting and long-lasting relief from pain and inflammation. Look for Curcumin Ultra today at your local retailer or at AOR.ca or AOR.us. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Supplementing Health. As always, you're here with Dr. Paul Herkel. Uh, this is part two of a really intriguing series that we have have with our special guest, Dr. Mark Fontes. Dr. Fontes is a naturopathic doctor with a focus on naturopathic oncology. Welcome, Dr. Mark. Thank you, Paul. Thanks for having me. Okay, so... If you haven't listened to episode one or of this of this series, it's a really must listen. It's really where Mark, you've done you did such a great job of of really breaking down where natural cancer care fits in with conventional care. We talked about a lot of the hot button topics and questions that people are going to be asking. Uh, you know, is is it truly complementary? What's the definition between alternative? And, and complementary and natural and why that causes confusion and then how to work with oncologists in combination with somebody like, like yourself, right? Mm -hmm. So we really did a good job of, of, of setting that foundation. And then in what I want to tackle here is something that's going to be a little bit more practical to natural health and some of the really great research that's coming out on some of the, the, the tools and strategies and interventions that we have in the naturopathic space. So let's talk a little bit about what you think about the ideal diet or the way of eating for somebody that has cancer or wants to be prevented for cancer. Because even, or even in around this, I mean, general cancer is quite controversial when you're looking at conventional versus naturopathic. But, right. you know, I've heard some really, really restrictive diets like the Gerson therapy, which is you know, like seven different juices a day from, uh, and your most of my patients have said they're just pretty much in the kitchen all day trying to make juices and it just mm -hmm. ends up being unsustainable. Yeah. So I, I'd like to hear your thoughts on some of the more extreme types of diets that are out there. Sure. So I, I guess in terms of, um, first with, with a recommendation and I guess I'll preface it by saying, um, for all listeners out there who are looking into this, um, to seek the advice of a naturopathic doctor to mm -hmm. get the certain intricacies involved in the type of diet we might be discussing. But generally from an overarching sort of perspective, I'll, I'll join to speak to people about looking at overall caloric intake, of course, and where those calories are coming from. And I'd say generally speaking, the focus being on um, managing overall carbohydrate intake. So that the general focus is on good healthy amounts of protein which helps with our in, uh, building our immune system good healthy fats and then from carbohydrates not net, not limiting to an extreme but to a place where blood sugar levels are regulated cholesterol levels are regulated um, inflammatory markers are regulated and again it comes back to that piece around the anti-inflammatory aspect of it all from a preventative standpoint um, and then in, in, in looking at are there any specific aspects to 
patients' cases around food sensitivities or allergies, um, removing certain foods, um, and or working on the gut as well, too, uh, to aid in the, the absorption and utilization of foods as well, too, right? That's, that's a huge piece. You could be taking in all the green juice and green veggies, but if, if your body's not appropriately breaking them down and absorbing them, then that benefit's not going to be there. And that's a, that's a huge foundational um, strength of our profession is, is working from that perspective first. Right. Of course, it's one of the common things that people will see in ND4 is, is gut health or hormones. That's right. But, you know, as we talked in the first uh, part of this, uh, in part one of this series, you know, you have additional training uh, with the, as, as a fellow of the board of naturopathic oncologists and, you um, and you have that additional training and to understand the on a yearly basis, what's the research coming out? So if I'm reading you correctly, mm-hmm. are you more of a promoter of a more keto style diet or a low carb diet rather than, you know, you hear a lot of, you know, Gerson's like all vegan, uh, right. which is not necessarily low carb in general, or is it? Right. Yeah. And this, that's such a good, good question. And where I think for, Firstly, you know, for for each patient, I think we all have a, a, a type of diet that or lifestyle that we each do well with. You know, certainly I've seen people who ate, let's say, more of a Mediterranean-based diet, um, and then when they were diagnosed, they switched to being vegan or vegetarian. And when that happens, we saw drops in their blood cell counts. Their immune system wasn't doing as well. Their hemoglobin was dropping. Their energy levels were dropping. And then they switched back to incorporating more, you know, healthy, good sources of, of protein, and they started feeling better versus other patients who will go vegan and, and it's the type of diet for them and they feel best that way. So whenever patients are open to trying those diets, definitely, certainly let's try it, but let's also monitor appropriately to see how your body responds, especially when it's a patient making this change in the middle of conventional treatment, you know, during chemotherapy or radiation or just prior to it. Uh, because first and foremost, we've got to make sure that the body, the body is in, in, in the best shape as possible to tolerate those treatments. Um, yeah, so I, those are great points for sure. Like there's, you're basically saying personalization is the way to go. Some people, vegan or plant-based may be the way to go and they right. feel better. Like I've had a couple of patients that come to mind that, you know, a colon cancer patient, he felt much better after going vegan and mm. we were monitoring his you know, red blood cell counts, his immune cells, these white blood cells that were basically indicators that we were on the right path. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's the the part I really want to stress is around, you know, studies that are out there or uh, any kind of fad diets that come out that look as a, a population wide approach to it. But of course, it's never the case. And um, certainly, you know, with a ketogenic diet, which has more from, a, I guess, a research perspective, for certain types of cancers, not certainly for all types of cancers. And just like with the keto diet, we've seen people who have really thrived on it um, and have lost weight and, and they've dropped their cholesterol and they're doing well during treatment and as well other patients who it just hasn't been the right diet for them. Um, and I, I, as a cornerstone, I still think that it comes back down to um, healthy, good sources of protein, whatever that, wherever mm-hmm. that protein comes from, um, good healthy fats and managing carbohydrates. Um, and so what and, I'll do a lot of times with, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, and I think you would want to include like lots of good quality, high nutrient foods, like plants and, and fruits. Absolutely. Oh, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and so a lot of times for patients will, will monitor and track their, their diet on the variety of apps that are out there right now to get a sense of what their macronutrient intake is like, you know, what, what are your, um, fats, proteins, carbohydrate intake looking like, and where do we need to make a change to make this as easy as possible as well too, without seeming overwhelming. Yeah. Those are all important considerations because a lot of people, what stage are they in their care? You know, are they in the middle of, of their, of their chemo radiation, where thinking about trying to eat something was, is makes them nauseous. And so that's a consideration. So, um, you know, you mentioned about gut health. So we're doing a lot of like gut rehabilitation, bone broths, soups, things that are very nutritive. And that's traditionally mm-hmm. been used in convalescence, people that are trying to recover and repair. So it's not, um, it sounds like from what you're saying, Mark, is that it's not just one diet fits all. There's a couple key pillars in there, but then after that, you've personalized it, right? 
Absolutely, yeah. And so what the the add on is, you know, the the patient's own medical history, what their goals are, and as you mentioned, which is such an important point, is you know where where are we in treatment? Is it is it as a preventative uh, perspective? Are they in treatment or is a prevention of recurrence? And a lot of times for for patients, the, from a dietary perspective, it changes. You know, we we spoke on the last podcast around Dr. Walter Longo's research around intermittent fasting. And so with a patient undergoing active chemotherapy, that's going to be a discussion, you know, because I view it in the day, our job to patients isn't, you know, do what I'm saying, but sharing information. And that's why I tell people on the first visit in the first minute is my job to you is to share what's out there. You know, here's what the research says. Here's what other patients have tried um, that's worked for them. And there may not be as much research out there. And also uh, other learned experiences from from treating people on this. And from that, let's build a plan that works for you and gets the outcome yeah. that we're all looking for here. Yeah, such a prudent approach. And I think patients hearing that, anyone listening uh, on this podcast, I think should be really reassured by, you know, that type of approach. Where is it like we are going to fit everybody into one way of eating and it's really extreme, it's really intense. Because, you know, one of the byproducts of, eating a, a, a healthier, and we'll use the word quote unquote, cleaner diet, people lose weight oftentimes. And for cancer patients, that actually is a scary proposition. One of the few cases mm-hmm. where they're always being talked to, we have to make sure that we're not losing weight because that's a sign that cancer is progressing. So often a lot of people are very freaked out when they start losing weight because that's often how the diagnosis might've been originally made. Right. Um, and actually, that was a follow-up question I had about uh, Dr. Longo's work, who, again, is really a world leader in, in looking at caloric restriction, fasting. And oftentimes, even clinicians are really scared to suggest fasting. And I wanted to reiterate, number, number one is only do it supervised. This is strictly supervised. Mm. This isn't someone going out and just water fasting for a week if they're doing chemo. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about there's good research right before and at the beginning part of it, but it needs to be monitored. Absolutely. And and it's to clarify you know, my, my point there, which you just shared is if we're looking at a fasting perspective that it's not, um, you know, several days in a row, but really targeted um, around the the chemotherapy. And this is all information you can easily find online. And there's other research groups now out there in big journals looking at the impact of this. Um, in the t- day before to the day after um, certain chemotherapy treatments to aid in the reduction of side effects and improvement of quality of life. So, and in the days outside of that, you know, going back into that healthy lifestyle and diet, but it's more targeted on those days specifically. Yeah. Let's shift gears into some of the other things that you recommend. So because, you know, our show is all about supplementing health, we're going to focus in on some of the the natural uh, extracts, nutrients that uh, have some of the best research behind behind them. But before we step there, I think it's worth mentioning, you know, you talked in, in part one about sleep and just the incredible importance of sleep, uh, reducing inflammation, optimizing your immune system. I, I talk to my patients all the time about the, the, the nighttime is a very active period of time, even though you're not up and awake, your body's extremely metabolically active and your immune system's active. So sleep is really important. Mm. Stress reduction, mindfulness is something we talk about a lot with patients and exercise. Is there anything, you know, over and above those three areas or anything that you'd like to add to that list there? In addition, yeah, to those to those cornerstones, I would add in the, the as we mentioned in the last podcast too, around the gut health support side of oh, things yeah. so that Again, you can eat all the food you want but and good food, but are you appropriately breaking it down and absorbing it and is your body utilizing it? Um, and so if there's, let's say, rapid transit time, you know, someone who has frequent bowel movements or they're noticing mucus in their stools, then the assumption there is that, well, are, are you absorbing all the nutrients you need to be absorbing? Um, and that's the role there for when you look at glutamine or you're looking at probiotics, um, phosphatidylcholine um, to aid in the uh, reducing reducing inflammation and supporting the healthy lining of the gut as well too, um, and the add-on there of, of again coming back to the anti-inflammatory aspect of what we can do through our diet. Um, so by uh, helping in terms of regulation of our blood sugars, um, eating lots of good healthy fats, lots of dark leafy greens as, as a simple way of mitigating inflammation in the body. Uh, but also looking at additional uh, recommendations, which we can which which we can speak about. 
Right. Uh, there's there's probably like four podcasts worth of information of unpacking what you just oh, said. Geez, that was yeah. so that was so <laughs> you know that was so insightful. Uh, you know, gut health is not just about gut health. I think that's the key takeaway. It's about the whole body. Systemic inflammation is really often begins at the level of the gut. So right. we do work a lot on the digestive system. It's also important point to make. You mentioned a couple of key nutrients. L-glutamine, it's a very common one that often is used, but primarily to offset some of the side effects that is associated with chemo and some of the other therapies because chemo targets the most rapidly dividing cells. And right. so L-glutamine, zinc, probiotics, vitamin D, omega-3s, these are the cornerstones of what the gut lining needs to properly function. That's right. So I'm sure that's something that you're talking to your patients a lot, a lot about. Um, so you mentioned plants and foods that we could eat that have an anti-inflammatory effect. So you mentioned uh, something like Boswellia, which is a, a herb. It's frankincense in the in in episode one. Mm -hmm. Why don't you talk a little bit about what you are finding to be some of the most effective preventative nutrients that you know really anybody that is looking at oh, I have a family history of cancer, or I've had cancer in the past. What are the things that people should be considering from a supplemental perspective? Sure. And, you know, certainly when I'm with new patients, I feel like they must get sick of me saying anti-inflammatory <laughs> through the course of the couple of hours we have together. But uh, when, when you look at, um, you know, medical textbooks, and, they, and they're, whether it be prostate cancer, breast cancer, lung cancer, and they speak about how these cells start and how they proliferate or grow, um, it, it Inflammation is inevitably in 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 the the text, and so as a preventative uh, strategy, it's it's anti-inflammatory. So you know we've spoken about some of the cornerstones of health there that regular exercise, you know, eating well, regular sleep, gut health are are easy ways that we can start to mitigate inflammation already. But from a nutrients perspective, um, I certainly I you know I was looking back at some previous uh, charts of mine, and, and fish oil comes up very frequently for me. Um, you know, we know that um, fish oil and a good quality fish oil can help reduce some major markers of, of inflammation in the body, which we can check in the blood and monitor during the course of treatment to make sure it's having that, that effect on, on people, um, as well as I tend to use the curcumin and, and boswellia. And I think the, the key thing here with these three supplements in particular is choosing the correct brands that allow for the best absorption. And that really is a key amongst these these three products, and certainly with curcumin and, and boswellia, especially as they are um, best best absorbed um, in, in the fat. So you want to look for products that are standardized to that quality of proper absorption. They're not just simply the ground up herb put into a capsule. Yeah, because you can get a lot of those the medicinal benefits from eating as part of your diet. I think that's a huge piece that uh, mm. we both advocate for. So getting you know, turmeric, which is, you know, a traditional Indian spice that's found in curry. It's very bright yellow and it has some of the most um, prolific research around cancer and, and many other inflammatory conditions. Mm -hmm. uh, but when we, when it comes to cancer, now the game has changed where you have a whole group of cells that are in a one mass that are rapidly dividing and basically hijacking the body's systems including our own immune system to not see it and to start working for it. So you need much higher doses. So I love that you brought up the bioavailability issue. So specifically one of the favorites that you uh, brought up is, is curcumin and boswellia. Mm -hmm. You mentioned about combining it with a fat. So in a supplement specifically, what should they be looking for and how do they know if this is a bioavailable formulation or not? So uh, when you yeah when you look at these products and and thank you for mentioning around the diet certainly of course we always recommend um, incorporating the dietary aspect of, of these foods but as you mentioned there an important piece is is the difference now where we're looking for a almost like a pharmacological effect out of these nutrients and we need to achieve higher blood concentrations um, and so what what I recommend looking for in these products is that it's you'll see certain words such as em emulsified. Um, so that the product is emulsified or incorporated to some type of fat to aid in its, in its absorption. Um, so you might see uh, ingredients in there with these herbs, um, such as medium, medium chain triglycerides, 
are phosphatidylcholine um, additives as well too, which are fatty molecules that just help in the absorption of herbs like boswellia and curcumin um, through our cell linings and get to where they need to get. That's right. Yeah. So because these herbs traditionally, um, well, they are just from a biochemical perspective, they are fat soluble, meaning they easily dissolve in fat, but not so well in water. So, I mean, mm -hmm. just a simple, you probably try to mix either both turmeric or boswellia, but let's say turmeric, which is a spice, try to mix it in water. It doesn't really mix really well. It kind of sits on top, but you combine it with a fat. To, it was what I was going to say is traditionally they were always eaten with fat. Right. They were always eaten with a little bit of milk, which has some natural milk fat in it, or, or they were put in butter or ghee, and they were heated, and that starts bringing out some of those volatile oils. So technology has allowed it, and I think this has been a huge asset for you know, clinicians such as yourself that are allowing you to get the power of some of these botanical herbs and substances, and now having them have a very drug-like effect. And, and I think that you need that when it comes to a, a tumor in the brain or a tumor in the breast that is now really like a we'll runaway train. We need to do something pretty impactful to have a positive effect, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, all right. Let's switch into another category that I think is really, really common and popular. Let's talk a little bit about mushrooms. You know, mm -hmm. they're, I know they're one of your favorites. Uh, how do you use mushrooms and how do you get the best out of them? Yeah, so we, we, we use um, a lot of mushrooms certainly in, in our practice um, from some of the main ones of reishi mushroom, uh, maitake mushroom, coriolis, agaricus. And what's been interesting to see over, over the years now is that uh, as research expands to see certain specific indica indications of some mushroom types for certain types of cancers or situations within, can within cancer care. So, you know, for example, Coriolis mushroom has been looked at a little more extensively in gastrointestinal types of cancers. So esophagus and, and stomach to intestinal cancers um, and the others for other situations as well, too. So where, where possible, we definitely try to give that specificity of the mushroom type for a specific cancer. But generally speaking, we know mushrooms and the components inside of them are, are great at stimulating the immune system. And so... We will commonly prescribe them for people who are going, undergoing certain treatments that we know will lower their immunity and lower their immune counts. You know, we'll see drops in their white blood cell counts or drops in their neutrophils. And so we'll recommend um, mushrooms to aid in, in, in keeping those blood cell counts elevated during treatment, which ultimately helps to reduce side effects and complications such as infection. Uh, and those are almost equally as important when you're going through conventional care, like things like infections, one of the biggest reasons the conventional care fails or has to stop is because white blood cell counts go down. So as you right. mentioned, what what we both love about mushrooms is that not only do they have anti-cancer properties, if I can even use that word, where meaning it, it stimulates the body's immune system to start targeting cancer cells better. There's research in animals showing that it has that effect. But then there's lots of human studies showing that when you take mushrooms, they're quite safe with a lot of conventional therapies. And that's that kind of, um, that complementary piece. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Uh, and what, what should somebody look for again, to get the best out of their mushrooms from, a from either a, both a dietary and a supplemental perspective? Yes. Yeah, so from a dietary, um, perspective, certainly cooking with, with whatever mushrooms that you can get is, is always recommended. Um, or if a lot of patients will do teas, you know, such as from shaga mushroom, which is a popular one. Um, so extracting that in hot water, which is the, the core piece around optimal um, mushroom utilization is being extracted in, in, in hot water. Um, and so when you look for a supplemental product, it's really taking, again, a close line at, at, those, um, at the side of the bottle to, to see how it was produced, how it was extracted. <clears throat> Some companies will state that it, it is a hot water extraction, which we know is the way to break down the tough cell wall that mushrooms do have to get the beneficial components that are inside of that cell wall. Um, mm -hmm. So looking for products that state that extra step in, in manufacturing so that, again, the best outcome is achieved through that. Right. Uh, there's also something to say about, uh, you know, when you cook with it, obviously you, you heat it up, um, you can make soups out of it. So that's almost like a hot water extraction. There. Yes. Yeah. Um, there's various different medicinal components of mushrooms. There's polysaccharides. You might see on the bottle 
a standardization. Typically, that's a good thing uh, to show that you know it's a high quality mushroom extract. You might even see uh, something like uh, beta glucans, which is a class of therapeutic molecules that have a lot of immune stimulating, uh, immune uh, cancer fighting benefit. So you might notice a product with that particular standardization. Mm -hmm. um, and then so, and there's various different types. You touched on a number of uh, really popular ones. Um, you know, you can look at, there's an extract that, um, that AOR makes called AHCC that actually comes from Japan. It's not made ourselves, but it has a lot of research and it, it really is a unique extract of, of shiitake. It's actually a combination of a multi, multiple forms of shiitake and multiple fungi. And it's grown on this medium that is made up of carbohydrates and it's actually specifically rice bran extract, which in its own right has antiviral and immune system enhancing qualities. So that's it. Mushrooms really take up the the uh, medicinal compounds of whatever medium that they're grown on. Uh, so that's another thing to consider is where are they grown, and that will also tell you the the type of uh, extract it is. And so HCC stands for active hexose correlated compound. So it's a very specific form. Of, uh, of mushroom that's from Japan that has a lot of really, really strong research in combination with chemo, antiviral, hepatitis. So I don't know if you used uh, that mushroom before. Mm -hmm. We have. Yes. Yeah. Thanks for mentioning that as, as, as well too. And, um, and exactly for those benefits that, that you've stated. Yeah. Right. And uh, the reason we talk about mushrooms in general, because it is one of the substances and natural compounds that has quite a bit of research in combination with some of the conventional therapies. And one of the biggest concerns a lot of people have is, well, is this green tea extract or is this curcumin extract safe with whatever chemo? And, and it may not be. And that's where working with someone like yourself, Mark, is going to be so invaluable to guide people that, you know, and I want to take all these things because I've done research on it and my friends are telling me to take this, but is it really safe for me? You know, you can obviously right. you talk to your pharmacist about that, but they may not be aware of some of these uh, ingredients in the same way that you are. Yeah, thank, thanks for saying that. And, and absolutely, like top of mind is always safety in that we're never just giving something to give something, right? It, it's really what's the rationale behind it? What's the what's the outcome we're looking for? And again, going back to how we monitor the effectiveness um, for each individual patient. And then choosing yeah. the best products where, where we can, absolutely. Yeah, and that makes a huge difference. I mean, cancer is something that you really need to be aggressive in treating. Uh, I think if, you know, you're looking just to complement things, that's one thing. But if you're if some patients want to be really, really active in their natural treatments, you need to, you know, step up the intervention. And I think that really feeds well into, you know, one of the last questions I wanted to ask you before we wrap up here, Mark, is, mm -hmm. you know, they're one of the things that naturopathic oncology is best known for is intravenous vitamin C therapy and, mm -hmm. and mistletoe. Some of these therapies that, you know, you can't get in a bottle. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that type of therapy and, and what people can expect for it and some of the research behind it? Sure. Yeah. We, we it's a common question that, that comes up with patients and um, again, similar to some of the nutrients we've discussed already, uh, just really exciting to see the research continue to grow and grow year, year over year and seeing different researchers and group study the effectiveness of intravenous vitamin C. Um, I'd say as, as a main um, recommendation, it, it's the research that's expanding around its use in combination with specific chemotherapy medications in order to potentially allow them to work better while also minimizing side effects. And certainly clinically, that's what we've seen with patients. Um, and so when we're kind of building up the treatment plan and, and seeing the medications patients are being prescribed, if these studies are out there to support the combination of intravenous vitamin C, we will discuss that with patients. And we also do utilize in a lot of cases of uh, prevention of recurrence, you know, so the patient has now finished their treatment um, schedule. Uh, their next CT scan is three or six months from now. Uh, they're not on any active treatment from the conventional side of things in many cases. And so it's, it's now, you know, on us to really maintain those therapies that we know can hopefully allow things to stay exactly where they are and allow for no further changes or growths. Yeah. You know, a lot of people ask, you know, they could probably find supplements at stores. People can make recommendations, which I, I don't advocate, uh, especially when it comes to cancer. You know, definitely mm -hmm. we've said throughout these last two parts, 
uh, these these episodes that you know working with someone such as yourself that can help guide and take a lot of that, that guessing out of it. But people are, are very interested in therapies that are going to be more powerful. And so mm. one of the tools that you mentioned is IV vitamin C. What's the difference between just taking plain old vitamin C orally and then actually having to do it IV? Because it is obviously more invasive. You know, you have to get uh, a needle. It's very, very safe. It's, it has, as you mentioned, some of the research behind it in both standalone as well as in combination with conventional care and reducing some of the side effects. But it also costs a little bit more and it's a little bit more right. time intensive. People have to right. sit there in, in your office. So why would someone want to do something IV or an injection like mistletoe therapy, which is a herb from, from Europe, versus just taking a supplement or taking a mistletoe or uh, you know, a, a, a capsule or an ampule from, from across uh, in, from in Europe? Right. Uh, well, I guess firstly with, with the intravenous vitamin C is that it's now been well documented that taking um, vitamin C intravenously compared to oral dosing significantly increases the concentration of vitamin C in, in, in the serum. Um, after IV compared to oral. So we know a limitation with vitamin C orally is that we can only absorb so much, and then we can we start to experience loose, looser bowel movements. So the body has a limit saturation point versus intravenously, we can go up to significant doses, you know, 50 grams, 75 grams or higher in some cases to really a a achieve that saturation inside of the body. And it's at that level where the research around vitamin C is where it's been shown to have that anti-inflammatory effect, the immune stimulatory effect, how it may have supportive um, anti-cancer benefit um, and anti-angiogenic or prevent the growth of blood, of blood vessels into tumors. And we do need to achieve that through um, intravenous um, dosing. And, you know, with, with I, IV therapy, and I will, I think, speak with other, and speak with our colleagues as well too, it's, it's, ends up being a really positive thing for a lot of patients, you know, being in, in that clinic space, typically with other patients in there as well too, speaking about their own journeys and issues and challenges, um, but also gaining that support from that community as well too. And also I think more contact, I'm sure you'd say the same thing that we're also in, in more contact with patients who are receiving IVs and, and being on top of their health in that way as well too is another significant benefit I find from those treatments. No, you're absolutely right. For sure. It can be almost like group therapy. Why is that even effective? Well, one of this is almost like you're getting the therapy together. A lot of times they will strike up conversations, friendships, and it's generally a very positive space. It's quite different than a lot of the experiences they get at the typical, you know, infusion centers and hospital settings where you, it feels a little bit impersonal and here it's, it's, it's quite different. And that's some of the benefit of working with a natural doctor because you're able to, take the time there's no rush to you know you the time is is there to to speak with patients about their personal needs and absolutely you know, and and as you mentioned the ivc is a good way uh of of doing that absolutely so, and go ahead oh and just to touch upon the mistletoe therapy and for the listeners out there it's you know a treatment that that comes from europe and in germany um and so you know we will utilize that therapy um for patients um, which can be given intravenously. It can also be done as a little injection on, under the skin. And the main purpose of that there is for its immune stimulatory properties. Um, and some of the best research with mistletoe as well, too, is in improving tolerance to chemotherapy um, and improving quality of life outcomes during treatment as well, too. So we'll discuss that therapy as well, too, in certain cases with, with patients. Just so, again, that it's all about being fully informed and here are your options and let's, let's put a plan in place that, that works for everyone. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing, uh, Dr. Fontes. This was uh, enlightening. Uh, both both series, we, again, outlining why you want to work with, um, you know, a natural therapy. What are some of the pros and cons? What are some of the misconceptions? And then, you know, this episode, we really dove into all the different uh, ways that you can use it, all the different therapies that we can actually use. And we talked about some of the things like vitamin C, as well as things like uh, botanical medicine. So hopefully everyone gets that's listening really found that helpful. I know I did. We'll have to have you back for another, another show at some point. But uh, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And for listeners out there, you can connect with me um, at Mark Fontes ND on Facebook or Instagram. And thank you, Paul, thank you, Paul for leading this discussion. This was great. 
Absolutely. Love to have you. All right. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll be in touch. And hopefully everyone will enjoy that episode. Please tune into our next episode uh, on the Supplementing Health Podcast. Thank you for listening today. For more information about our guests, past shows, and future topics, please visit aor.ca slash podcasts. Do you have a topic that you want us to cover? We invite you to engage with us on social media to request a future topic or email us at marketing at aor.ca. We hope you tune in again next week to learn more about supplementing your health.